So good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come to this uh, blockchain in healthcare, bridging trust in response to the COVID-19 webinar. We've had nearly 500 people register for the webinar, so it's great to see so much interest in the topic. Firstly, I wanna thank Block.co, who have brought together this great team of international healthcare experts. Um, to discuss the enormous potential that blockchain technology can have on this sector. Block.co is a pioneer in blockchain credentialing applications um, and has done a fantastic job of raising awareness about the latest blockchain technology trends and opportunities in the sector. So this is their third live webcast addressing blockchain and its impact in various sectors, and I'm sure they will have many more to come. After this webinar, all attendees will receive a self-verifiable certificate of attendance anchored to the Bitcoin blockchain, which is powered by Block.co's open source solution. So what that means is you're all gonna get a certificate, you can give that to your employers, your university, you can prove your success at attending this webinar, and they can independently go and verify this via the blockchain. Pretty exciting technology. So on to this webinar. Health is obviously one of the most important topics affecting everyone's life, but particularly it's been brought to the forefront since the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Regardless of region or continent, there has been a scrambling to try and respond to it. And this has really highlighted the increasing demand for digital technologies to replace our old ways of communicating. Frankly, this affects all sectors, but particularly in healthcare at the moment. Blockchain and digital ledger technologies have some really unique features, in particular relating to being able to trust data and to make it more accessible. And so today we're going to talk about how these innovations are changing the healthcare landscape and the current trends improving our lives. So a brief introduction about me before I give our panelists time to introduce themselves. So my name is Georgina Kiriakoudis. I've been involved in blockchain for about five years now. Um, having been one of the first people in the world to gain a master's in the topic back in 2017. I actually did my thesis on medical records and blockchain, which led to me being published in The Lancet, which is one of the most sort of prestigious uh, medical journals in the world, and also advising on various projects such as with the NHS UK. Since then, with my co-founder, I launched our company, Decentric Health, which has developed two state-of-the-art blockchain-powered mobile applications for patients and doctors, providing patients with complete and seamless access to their medical records. Our mission is really to empower patients to take ownership over their digital health. The one side of this is supporting them and their medical providers to understand their health data. So we provide data analytics tools such as trend analysis on blood results, uh, but also through blockchain, we give them the tools to safely share their health data without fear that they may be compromising their privacy. We feel that this allows us to achieve the unlocking of previously fragmented data to not only support our own health and our family health, but also to support the greater good, such as medical research and national responses to crises like the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're currently piloting with the American Medical Center and expanding out from there with many new opportunities we'll be announcing soon. So enough about that. I'm going to then give a chance to our panelists to introduce themselves. Unfortunately, Dr. Alice Lovers is, seems to have had an emergency and she's not here yet. Let's hope she'll join us soon. 
but we can start by introducing our other two experts. So let's start with Ahmed Abdullah. Can you tell us a bit about you and your company, Digi Farm? Hey guys, good evening. I hope you're well. So my name is Ahmed Abdullah. I'm the founder and CEO of Digifarm. I'm a health economist by, by trade with experience across the pharmaceutical pipeline, um, working on both the payer side, so reviewing submissions for access to the UK market from pharma companies and medical device companies, and then also recently working as a gl global health economist at Roche, so working to get high cost cancer therapies um, into global markets. Um, and that's really where the idea for, for Digifarm came along. Um, so Digifarm work on implementing performance-based agreements for healthcare technologies and healthcare services using blockchain technology. So when the burden of proof for healthcare payments is moving to outcomes data and no longer fee for volume approach, we need to use blockchains infrastructure that's immutable, that enables trustless data sharing, and then utilizing smart contracting to eliminate the administrative burden and really remove the requirement for manual processing of health data. Fantastic, that's really interesting, Ahmed. And Demetrius, tell us about you. Uh, hello everyone, and thank you Blocko for this uh, webinar, very interesting webinar. Uh, I have graduated from the University of Nicosia in 2017. I have a law degree uh, in English law. Uh, before joining VeChain in 2019, uh, I was doing my training contract in London in a law firm, uh, which I had to drop in order to join VeChain. And about VeChain, we started in 2015 as a private consortium company. And we started experience blockchain with uh, specific customers like BMW and LVMH for specific uh, projects like a verified car. Uh, in 2017, we realized that the real power of blockchain is on the decentralized uh, area, and that's why we moved to Ethereum. After a year of exploration in Ethereum, we realized that there are some aspects of the decentralization that um, are, let's say, not attractive to traditional enterprises and business, and also some parts of centralization that are needed in order to onboard such business. Uh, so we created our own uh, public permission blockchain uh, based on proof of authority, also known as VeChain Store blockchain. And from, uh, from 2019, we started building different tools from infrastructure layer up to uh, end user uh, tools uh, for people to start onboarding and try the blockchain. Uh, one of the tool, our flagship tool, uh, which most of the solutions are built on top of it, is the VeChain toolchain which is a SaaS platform that allows you to collect uh, different information from different processes from a business uh, uh, or a company, and then allows you to securely store it, uh, store it um, as a form of cash on the blockchain. Uh, and that information then uh, you can manage it and be shared in different, um, uh, in, in, in different aspects, for example, you can connect it with different IoT solutions for us, RFID, NFC, QR code, and then the end user can see the collected information that is securely stored in the VeChain Store blockchain by scanning the QR code or the NFC or the RFID. The beauty about the VeChain toolchain is allows you to experience the blockchain without even touching the crypto, without even being, uh, let's say, involved at all in the coding uh, of uh, a smart contract. Uh, we achieve that with the fee delegation, uh, so we take care of the back end of the smart contract, but also the transaction costs on the blockchain. Uh, about uh, healthcare, for the last uh, eight months, we have been working with our channel partner, Idante, with a Cyprus company, uh, to develop a solution for the Mediterranean hospital. Uh, we started developing one solution, we ended up with two solutions, and we're going to discuss it further uh, in this conversation. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Demetrius. Okay, so the first thing I want to do, actually, I'm going to put a poll up on, on the screen on Zoom. So I uh, just want to ask you guys, so asking the attendees out there, what is your job role? So you guys, health professionals, business owners, entrepreneurs, or managers, 
academic researchers or students, it's always interesting to know who we have uh, joining us today. So I'll just give a few more seconds for everyone to vote, but I see the votes are coming in quickly. So a few seconds there. Okay. All right, any more quick answers? I'm going to end the poll so we can move on forward. All right, so it seems we have quite a nice mixture today, um, but we see business owners, entrepreneurs and managers being the leaders in this. I mean, you guys are, I think, uh, highly innovative people, so I'm sure that um, that's why you guys want to learn about blockchain as such an innovative technology. Okay, so let's carry on then. We're going to go into our first set of questions. Um, we've got some questions which I'm going to present to the panelists, but also do ask your questions and we'll do our best to address as many as we can. So I want to start by asking you, Dimitrios and Ahmed, both of you, uh, what your opinions are on what are the expected changes in healthcare, in healthcare using blockchain? And can you elaborate on some of the benefits which you expect to be seen? So if anyone wants to take that question. Um, do you want me to go? Um, so <clears throat> I see uh, blockchain really as a, a really interesting and enabling technology within healthcare. Um, we see now very recently there's been a lot of hype around the blockchain and things like AI and ML and, and how it can improve uh, efficiency within healthcare systems. And um, we, what, what, I, what we've seen in, in our work at the UN as well, which I haven't really discussed yet, um, we really focus on three main areas, to be honest, in where blockchain can bring efficiencies. And that's the transfer of data uh, the transfer of funds and the transfer of goods. So blockchain can really help support things like uh, preventing the sale of counterfeit medicines. It can help with uh, tracking serialization. Um, when you're looking at the, you know, the transfer of data, we're looking at being able to support the storage and, and exchange of data securely um, around identity management as well. And in regards to um, the transfer of funds, it can help support claims processing and prior authorizations and insurance-based health systems. It can support value-based reimbursement, which is what we do around Digifarm. And it can also help around the auditability around all of these areas as well. Fantastic. And Demetrius, do you have anything to add to that? Well, what I wanted to say about COVID-19 in general, it what showed to the world is the deficiency in the healthcare. Uh, I mean, what we could have done better in terms of preventing the spread, but also having a better treatment and also um, answers to the patients. And what blockchain is bringing in general in the table is revolutionizing and digitalizing the, um, the processes and finding different bottlenecks, uh, creating a transparent system. And as Ahmed said, the ownership and transfer of the medical record uh, ask uh, by permission is very important because I believe that the, the medical record uh, it's ownership of the patient. And so far, what we have seen in the previous years and in the past uh, decades is that that ownership is centralized, uh, collected by the healthcare uh, providers and are not actually accessible to the patient himself. So what blockchain can bring on the table is bringing back and actually um, bring the ownership back of the data back to the real owner, who is the patient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say I strongly agree with that, definitely. I mean, I, uh, to be honest, I don't know many people that have all their medical records held, stored and in their own ownership or even know who has them, which doctor has them, what medical institutes have them. So I think it's really important, the benefits of blockchain to give that ownership back to patients. But I think the beauty of that is also allowing them to then be able to feel safe in sharing that information. Because in the case of something like COVID-19, where that information is, is needed by government organizations, by researchers, 
it's really important that the patient still feels they have the ownership over their record, but also it's really important that they can mm, safely share their records to other people and that that information can be used for all the different purposes, whether it's, yeah, research, natural responses to COVID or insurance or you know, value-based healthcare. So I think there's many areas which, yeah, that's definitely um, really blockchain is going to bring a, a complete game changer uh, in that terms. So let's go on some questions for uh, you guys. So Ahmed, your company, Digifarm, it helps to bring down the healthcare costs globally. That's, you know, value-based healthcare. So how would you comment on the huge price variation of COVID tests around the world? I mean, in Cyprus, we're paying as little as 60 euros for a test. And then we see, you know, in the US talk about the same test being uh, costing people tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, how can we use uh, resources more efficiently and more effectively to increase the value out of the money which we're, we're investing? Yeah, I'd say I'd, um, initially that, that initial point about the disparity in, in uh, COVID-19 tests around the world. I think inherently the way healthcare systems and way healthcare is paid for and commissioned is, is very different uh, uh, from country to country, none more so than the US. Um, over there, there have been instances where a, a, a routine test can be billed at a few thousand dollars. And in some instances, it can be uh, as a few hundred dollars or even less than a hundred dollars. And I think it, it, it's, it's about the way that they pay for healthcare. There have been some instances, for example, in the US where insured patients have actually been charged a lot more than uninsured patients, right? And it's just the way that these agreements are set, are set up between the payers and the providers. There is no regulation of healthcare prices in the, in the US. Um, the way these organizations calculate resource use as well is very different. Um, some is controversial, some is not so controversial. So I think what, what this type of technology can do, it can help support the transition to a value-based approach that you mentioned. And, and the main way it does that is by increasing transparency. It empowers patients to, to really, as you, by holding their, their records on, on their own medical records, they're able to understand more about, you know, um, their current health states, how health, how health insurances see them. I mean, I take the example of myself. I mean, I'm pretty healthy, I'm pretty young, but often if you look at a person as a medical record, you'll see, people don't realize how many different, you know, um, times they've been to the doctor and the different things within their record. So they're, they're looked at quite differently by payers and by providers. And unfortunately, this is something that's been taken advantage of uh, while people haven't had this this ability to be empowered to to control these these types of things, um, so I think that's what you know uh, an additional benefit that a, talk, a technology like this can do. You know, it, it it really empowers people to take things into their own own hands, whether it's money transfer or whether it's holding their own record and things like that. I think that's one of the uh, key words in blockchain, transparency, you know, and it just makes uh, yeah, the world of difference have that transparency. And um, so thank you for that. That's really interesting. Okay, Demetrius. So there are many different stakeholders in the healthcare industry from healthcare providers, insurance companies, pharmaceuticals. What do you see are the main benefits derived for each stakeholder by utilizing uh, technology such as the blockchain and what are your thoughts regarding the usage of open public blockchains instead of closed permission blockchains for this purpose? Okay, for the first part of the question, I mean, in order to understand and identify the different stakeholders, we need to understand what is the scope of every project. So first we need to identify what we want to achieve by a project and then we identify the stakeholders. So for example, in the EH search solution, that is the solution that we have launched recently with the Mediterranean Hospital, uh, it's pretty simple uh, project in terms of identifying the stakeholders and uh, the benefits. For example, one of the stakeholders is the LIS, which is the laboratory information system. 
that uh, actually runs the molecular test for the COVID-19 test. And the other stakeholder, uh, it's the end user who receives those um, results for his testing for COVID-19. Uh, on the back end, of course, there is Aidante, uh, who is making sure that the, um, everything, the flow, the processing of the data uh, is um, GDPR compliant, but also uh, how you share it uh, as an experience uh, on the app of the user. Uh, that is just an example, uh, but as I said, uh, in order to identify different stakeholders, you need to understand also what is the scope of a project. Uh, in the part uh, two question about the differences between uh, public blockchains and private blockchains, if I understood correct the question. Um, well, let's start from um, the biggest difference, which is transparency. Uh, a public blockchain, it has the maximum level of transparency. Uh, there is the ledger where you can see the transactions. Of course, some of the private blockchains they have the ledger, but they can share it with you, but it's not accessible to all of the public. When we think about blockchain, we need to think about in the democratic way. And who is the best, uh, let's say, um, audience that uh, actually, the, the check and balances in a democracy rest on the people. So if I have a solution that is permitted only to some people to read the transaction, how accountable, open accountability is justified mm -hmm. on that one. The other difference is cost. When you are implementing a solution um, on a private blockchain, it's much more expensive than a public blockchain, especially when you want to maintain that solution and, and you have also the updates. On a public blockchain, those updates, especially in the VeChain Store blockchain, those updates are not uh, costly at all to the end user or to them, excuse me, uh, to, to, the, to the business that are using the public blockchain. And I want to use an example about the, the running cost and the difference between public and private. Recently, uh, we had two startups that they left a private blockchain. I'm not going to name it for various reasons. Uh, and they joined the VeChain Store blockchain. And the reason was, for example, one certificate to be uploaded in the public blockchain of VeChain Store costs less than a euro, where in the private blockchain, there was the cost of developing this solution, but also uh, every time you uploaded it, there was a significant uh, price. Uh, I think it was 100 times more than the certificates that was uploaded in the public blockchain. And the last one, it's about how easy it is to, let's say, create a consortium in a public blockchain. When I say consortium, for example, I'm going to use, um, without giving names because we're under NDAs, um, uh, Mediterranean Hospital was the first one that uh, hospital that was using is using the AH cert, and we have I think two or three more that are onboarding. So in order to create this consortium uh, in a private blockchain, you need to share information of those let's say hospitals, but that can sometimes give a competitive disadvantage to the others that are joining. Whereas in a public blockchain, that information. Uh, is actually is transparency openness because it has been verified on the blockchain, so you don't need to do a due diligence. Uh, I think these are the let's say the main uh, differences of the uh, private and the public blockchain. Okay, and following on from that, we've had a question here that says to Dimitrios, from your experience, what are some of the disadvantages of decentralization? to traditional businesses apart from disintermediation? And some of the disadvantages of decentralization. Well, the disadvantage, it rests on the regulation. There is no legal framework on mm -hmm. the decentralization or the public blockchain, how to use it. Just recommendation papers, and there is uncertainty. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of uncertainty. I mean, I remember when we started uh, with some clients using the public blockchain of Vichy Thor, they were asking us, okay, Dimitri, how I justify uh, the use of crypto on the transaction fees on my accounting department or on my legal department. Uh, but as Vichy, we solved it that with the fee delegation, we take care of the transaction fee on behalf of the client or the channel partner. But another disadvantage of decentralization is like the world is not ready yet to jump from A, uh, from a to Z. So there is a loop, there is um, an area, gray area, a transition area that needs to get mature with the help of the legal framework 
uh, I hope it will come sometime soon, uh, to, let's say, clear up the waters. Okay, great, thank you. I think um, Dr. Alice Lovies has just managed Sorry. to Sorry, sorry about that, there's the way the world goes. Sorry. Exactly. These things happen. Don't worry. Um, you know, we're not too far in, so don't worry. Do you want to just start by introducing yourself to everybody then? Oh, sure. Yeah. Nice to meet everyone. I'm Dr. Allie Lovies, and I lead uh, healthcare blockchain for Ernst & Young. And by back, way of background, I'm a physician and clinical informaticist with a board certification in clinical informatics. So I tell people I'm bilingual. I, I speak clinical and I speak IT <laughs> and the policy and regulations <laughs> around it. Around it. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, it's good timing then. So we, we have your question uh, on the hand. So I wanted to ask you then. So the World Health Organization has said that the asymptomatic spread of the coronavirus is very rare. Can you tell uh, us how you think blockchain tracking tools could have prevented the global lockdown and the effects which that had on the economy? Well, and do you, I, Yeah. Hmm. Sorry, go ahead. I, I think they yeah. backed off of that statement. Okay. They, they released that statement and very quickly backed off of it. Right. Okay. Almost within within twelve hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, do you think that blockchain and and the tools which which they um, could improve the information that we have on the virus? I I think they can. I think the the way is not not jumping all the way to COVID immunity certificates, like we've, in, in our development of COVID certificates, we've taken out the word immunity, right? I, I think where blockchain can help, it's gonna go back to data and managing data and managing data from different sources as we're learning about this illness, mm -hmm. right? So when, when for example, World Health Organization said it and then they backed off of it within 12 hours. We have had in the US our secretary general say, don't buy masks. And now, of course, everyone's like, everybody wear a mask. And I think that's what frustrates the public. I think it frustrates people trying to respond to it. I think it frustrates technologists trying to build tools to solve for it, is we don't have the information we need. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we, the first step for blockchain is assimilating that information in a way that if we can rely on the sources, that's the, the other thing too. That yeah. Can we trust uh, a different country and even different states in the United States, can we trust when they're reporting mm -hmm. on the incidents of, do we have enough information? So another, <laughs> but yeah. Can it be stored as a database to store time stamp medical records someone popped up? Boy, that's one of the first things I, I would love to get out about blockchain. People love to, to point to certain countries have put everyone's medical record on a blockchain, and right? And so I tend not to talk about countries. I tend to talk about the number of people. So mm -hmm. to a point, you can scale and put people's information on a blockchain, but it doesn't scale. We have 330 million people in the United States, right? Are we going to put all of their information on a blockchain? No. We don't, no one wants everybody access to it at that time. So I don't see that... Um, Blockchain is a great use for timestamp medical records. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you Maybe see it more for, for what sort of information do you see it being useful? More for reporting information, the sort of tools. Yeah, we love the, the model of what blockchain is really good at is sending over the algorithms to mm -hmm. protected databases, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to move data on the blockchain. We don't, mm -hmm. want to, we don't want to put everything into a data lake and everything sent on the blockchain. I'll make up numbers, but say you had 10 people in a consortia, 10 nodes, which is small, but everyone's sharing the information. There's a breach at one, all 10 are now reliable, are, are liable for that breach. Mm -hmm. uh, we certain, certainly wouldn't want that. So if you leave data to sit within the entities that are responsible for its security and access, and I send an algorithm in and I return insight from, that's a fantastic use of blockchain mm -hmm. because I haven't moved any protected health information whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But I, however, I've gained a lot of insight and information. That's where I see the power of blockchain. Okay, great, thank you. All right, okay, I'm gonna ask a quick poll to the audience then. Uh, so uh, let me just, 
Okay, we've just put another poll on your screen. So what I want to ask is, what is your organization's familiarity with blockchain? So are you actively using blockchain, experimenting with blockchain, aware of blockchain, uncertain about your organization's familiarity, or no, none whatsoever, no familiarity with it? I'll just give you another 10 seconds or so to answer that. And we'll see. It's really interesting to see. Darn, we can't vote. Oh, sorry. No, <laughs> you can tell us. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm going to end that then. Um, okay, so we sort of are sitting in, in the middle. Most people are saying aware of blockchain and then kind of an equal split of being some being more aware and some being less aware. So I guess part of this webinar is probably people getting to know a little bit more. Okay, so let's move on to some more questions, more looking at the technology and the standards around the technology. So let me start with a, another question for Alice then. So Alice, what are your thoughts regarding combining technologies like AI with blockchain? And we've heard about the Trek COVID model. Can you tell us more about that as well? Sure. So blockchain onto itself is um, just a single tool. And if we're starting to look at data and work with data, it, it makes sense that you would have AI on top of that. And the mm -hmm. way I try to explain blockchain to people is it's the plumbing that delivers Plumbing is supposed to deliver pure, clean, trusted <laughs> water source, right? The same thing now, take out the word water and put in data. So I have clean, trusted data that now I can act upon. And so AI on top of that, it's a fantastic use for blockchain. And there were two parts to that question. You asked about the, what was the second part? Uh, the Trek COVID model, uh, which I believe is using do you know the track covid model uh which is well, using, you know yeah. i i think that we've seen so much pushback on that because of privacy issues and concerns and and who's using it so when we and i'm just i'm speaking from a nursing young perspective now and also from a personal health care perspective we tend not to use a uh, blockchain for that because we don't want that would be an invasion of privacy unless you had specific consent from the person and they could withdraw that consent and pull their information at any point in time. And that's how, when we talk about COVID certificates, that's our model. It starts with and ends with the person, that they give the consent and they can withdraw the consent. And they, it only gets used for the purposes they consent for. It never gets pulled into a, a data lake, anything like that. So mm -hmm. same way with the track and trace, we haven't uh, used blockchain for track and trace because we think it's too much of an invasion of privacy. Okay. But of course, I mean, do you see blockchain being used to manage this consent to access records? Absolutely. To manage, it's fantastic mm -hmm. for managing data sharing consent. We have a couple models in the U.S. and uh, another company, not 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 ours, um, First IQ has used that and then attached. They they don't get the consent, but if they have con if if another entity gives it, gives them consent, they can attach that as a metadata. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is a great use for yeah. blockchain making sure that the consent and the data match. I think that's definitely been a bit of a questionable area on whether we need to be given consent. I know that within Europe, they've sort of superseded a bit GDPR and said that, you know, COVID-19 results are allowed to be shared with, with certain authorities without consent. And that's Maybe true in the US. That's, that's, that's true yeah. in the US as well. Yeah, I think that's maybe acceptable during an emergency crisis public health, right not really long people right and, and public health emergency and then again shared with public health officials yeah which is different from sharing it with a large conglomerate information technology conglomerate yes exactly. that they have the right to look at that oh, but yeah public yeah. health officials who are responsible for mm -hmm. tracking and tracing that that's mm -hmm. uh that's allowed in the u.s as well okay okay and ultimate um Given your involvement with the UN, how do you see the UN work on setting standards for this technology? Mm -hmm. So I'll just give an introduction first about that work to, to mm -hmm. the attendees, because uh, I kind of missed it in my introduction. So I'm leading the blockchain and healthcare team at the UN Center for Trade Facilitation and E-Business. And what we have done 
<clears throat> is actually develop a, a blockchain and trade facilitation white paper. And I was leading the blockchain in healthcare chapter. Uh, in addition to that, now we've, we've done that phase of the project, the next phase is actually setting up an advanced technology advisory board at the UNCFAC to support stakeholders, whether they are private or, or public organizations on what the best technology is to use and looking at blockchain, AI, ML, and whatever it may be. So in regards to, to that specific work relating to blockchain, it's about actually creating standards and, and how these systems should be used in a safe way, in, 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 in a way that enables all stakeholders to benefit from this. And then actually creating electronic business standards for this technology to facilitate trade, uh, whether it's trade of goods or how, how, how data should actually be, should be managed in a safe way and things like that. So that's, that's the key aim because what you have right now is a lot of private organizations reaching out to public entities and trying to sell them this, this blockchain dream essentially, right? So, and there is nobody there that these stakeholders can go to and say, look, we've been, we're, we're thinking about implementing this type of solution um, for this specific problem. Is it right? I mean, blockchain is clunky. It's often very expensive as, as, as Demetrius has mentioned. So, it's about making sure that when these stakeholders are selecting this technology stack, whether it's right for them or if as, or, or could there be an alternative? So, you know, as, as Dr. Alice has mentioned, you know, it's not always right to have a medical, a blockchain based medical record system, right? Um, um, it's, it's not always feasible for simple data transfer. There is often no need to use, you know, a, a blockchain type system. So it's just about creating the standard um, for, for new digital economies and, and then supporting stakeholders going into the future. So there's a series of white papers and then there will be now the establishment of an advisory board that can advise stakeholders uh, with this. Okay. And I don't know, you know, how much you uh, with the UN work on GDPR, but we've got a question here that asks about the compatibility of blockchain in healthcare with GDPR and other personal data protection regulations. If Ahmed, you have comments or if any of the other uh, team have comments. I'd say, um, you know, it, it's, it's about how you utilize the technology and what data you're, you're putting on the, on the blockchain, you know, um, Typically, if you're using it as, as just an auditing tool to timestamp certain transactions and then you're not using patient data, um, then you're not going to have any issues around GDPR. I mean, just to use our example where we're using it for value-based contracting within healthcare, often we can take aggregations of, of a group of patient data and use that to make the calculation using smart contracts so there's no need for you know, uh, patient uh, identifiable data to be on that system. Um, we can take, you know, create crypt cryptographic hashes of patient identi identities or use a tokenization mechanism in order to remove any, uh, you know, identifiable uh, uh, pieces of data or anything like that. So there's many ways that you can do it. Um, there is a risk there if you're not doing that properly for that data to be, you know, uh, exposed on an immutable uh, uh, ledger, but but it, it's about you know managing that properly. And as long as you are able to conform to all the information governance requirements, privacy by design when developing that system and deploying, then we don't see any issue around that. Yeah, I have to say I agree. Like I mean, privacy by design in many ways that's exactly what blockchain is sort of doing in the first place. A lot of people, the reason we're choosing blockchains is to enable more privacy. So while of course, you know, GDPR is being set up, not necessarily with blockchain in mind and hence some problems like the right to be forgotten on an immutable ledger become more difficult. I think when you look more at the core of GDPR or other data protection regulations, it's actually great. We have companies that are really thinking about this from the beginning, thinking about privacy from the beginning, thinking about who are the data owners. And that's actually the right way of looking at things going forward. Alice or Dimitros, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, probably, absolutely, I agree. agree. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, Alice, you want to go first before I comment? Uh, all I said was I totally agree. <laughs> Good. <laughs> 
that's easy. All right. Yeah. All right, all right. I, I want to add something. I absolutely agree with you guys that uh, what you said. Uh, what um, GDPR brought on the table, it goes without thinking about blockchain. All we see from GDPR about blockchain is just recommendation, papers from EU. And actually, what uh, is my advice to anyone, not just in the medical uh, sector, but they want to use um, personal data and put it on the blockchain, is that you need to have, as you said, the privacy by design, but also don't put it as a raw data on the blockchain. There are other ways, other ways even, even the hashing, yeah, there are many people saying that, okay, we can put data using uh, APIs on the hashing, but that one, it can be identifiable. So there are other ways uh, on different layers before it reaches to the blockchain, how you make sure that you use the best practices to become, as we said, GDPR compliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is my suggestion. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, also, you know, Alice also said, you know, there are risks with putting data directly on the blockchain. But then the other thing is the side of the blockchain is immutability. And one of the key key purposes of the blockchain is to, to have this immutability feature. So the benefit, that, despite the difficulties which come with it, that come with putting data on the blockchain allow us actually to have more trust in that data. So yeah. I think there's a bit and, of and let, me, let me push back a little bit there. Um, I, I think there are areas where you need immutability if, if immutability doesn't exist. Uh, mm -hmm. In the U.S., certified electronic health records already have the immutability. Right? That's a requirement of an electronic health record. Mm -hmm. That data can't be altered. It has to be able to be signed off on, timestamped, and not alterable. Mm -hmm. That exists, function within. Um, if you ever hear any talk by our U.S. blockchain leader for every sector, he's the biggest one to push back and say, why do we need blockchain for that? Right? Mm -hmm. You really, really have a firm test. So in the idea of healthcare and patient information, immutability exists within electronic health records. So I don't gain anything by putting that on blockchain. I think that's, that's an important part. Uh, there's already, I, I can see everybody who touched uh, that record. There's already an audit trail that also exists. It's immutable within the electronic health record itself. So I really have to push and say, what are you gaining by putting? But I mean, there's been a lot, there's a lot of, you know, medical record fraud. And um, that's definitely a huge issue. I mean, surely that question. Well, fraud is, I mean, data, fraudulent data. I mean, blockchain, how can I say this? We've got to be really careful about the, what, just because something exists on a blockchain does not mean it's fraudulent. Doesn't that mean no. it's not fraudulent, right? Sure. Bad data. Absolutely into a blockchain is bad data. So that's another thing. Like be really, I want to caution people and not just say, oh, this is blockchain. So it's therefore it's perfect, perfect yeah. data. Mm -hmm. It's better than not, but it's not the guarantee of, you know, the guarantee of is, is who writes to it, how they're held accountable, how it's cross-checked, all mm -hmm. those things. But people can still put in data that might not be accurate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Alice. And what is important when we're putting something on the blockchain in general, I mean, the more clean is the data source, the right. more uh, credibility and transparency it brings right. on the blockchain. I hear a lot of people saying that blockchain brings the ultimate transparency. I'm here to say that it makes better transparency, but it's not the ultimate transparency. It okay. does, it, everything depends on the data source and how far is clean the data source and how the human factor is, uh, let's say, involved or not on That's that right. uh, collection of data. Someone just put up a great comment to uh, fraudulent data differ from tampered with data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Data that's been tampered with is now fraudulent, right? But you could have started with fraudulent. Sure. Yeah. Great yeah. point someone put up. Could go either way. Um, okay. And. All right, so uh, I've just got, there's a couple of questions on here. So one question is asking uh, whether we can discuss the use of oracles in healthcare solutions. How important do you think oracles are? So I guess it comes back to this question of what's feeding in the data to the blockchain. Any comments? Well, what I'm thinking now, right now, I'm thinking of the use cases and the solutions we have built with the Mediterranean Hospital and Idante. Uh, I put my bet on the IoT. 
Internet mm -hmm. of Things. I mean, if you have Internet of Things, you might avoid oracles. Uh, for example, they search um, the laboratory system. Once it has a result, it talks directly on the blockchain with the result, mm -hmm. of course, with the privacy by design. So we're avoiding the human inter inter interference. As I said, it, it depends on the designing. Everything mm -hmm. starts with the architecture, the designing, and the use of a different IoT. All right. Well, that leads on then, Demetrius. I've got a question for you. Tell us a bit more about this e new health life and REN app, which is to be used in the Mediterranean hospital. And how has the government been involved in this? And, and why do you think, what are their reasons for being involved in a blockchain solution? What do they see as, as the benefits? Well, uh, as I said in the beginning, we have two solutions. Uh, the one is the e new health life, which is an ecosystem solution. And the other one is the EH cert. If I can call it, it's like a mini app, which actually is a lab test electronic wallet for COVID-19 testing. And mm -hmm. in, the, in the next few weeks, it will be available for every, every uh, lab testing in, happening in the Mediterranean hospital. Uh, so I'm gonna start from the EH cert, which is more simple. Uh, as I said, it's a lab test electronic wallet that push ups in for, um, the result of a patient that's been tested for COVID-19 uh, at, uh, at, at this time, uh, just speaking. Um, uh, so, so far um, they have been tested, they have given the consent to download this application, 2000 people coming from abroad because the internal hospital is doing the testing in the airports. And the feedback we get is like, uh, they like it and the importance about it. It's like, you have the time stamping, uh, you have when the, um, the sample was collected. So there is an element of, um, let's say, immutability, security, and integrity of data. Uh, whereas uh, some people, they can bring their certificate and they can put it on the blockchain, as you said, where is the guarantee? Uh, so with the EH cert, we have the integrated already from the lab machine talking immediately on the blockchain. Uh, so this is the use case of the EH cert. It's very simple. Uh, it's more or less, as I said, the lab test, electronic wallet, for all the testing uh, happening in the lab test. Uh, about the new health life, uh, it's a more complex solution. As I said, it's an ecosystem solution. Uh, we have developed it for the emergency room of the hospital, Mediterranean Hospital of Cyprus with Aidante. Um, so what is it about? It starts everything from the patient visit in the emergency room. The patient is given an NFC card when he's registered in the system first time, uh, so he can be identified by the hospital uh, totem, which acts as a reception, and he can put uh, the reason of his visits on the system. Then um, it, it is time, ta it's time stamped, uh, and it proceeds to uh, the waiting room when it is called for triage. Then on the different triage, it's given the different category, uh, and based on the need, he proceeds to the doctor in the emergency room. Uh, when his visit uh, is done, uh, he scans again the NFC card and the visit is closed. The importance about it is when the patient can go, uh, go back home or even in the hospital, can get access to his medical record using the Inuker Life web app, and he can see all of the diagnosis that took place, uh, the, the reasoning why he was given this consumable, and uh, all of the patient, let's say, journey. Uh, Another interesting part that brings on the table is the data ownership. So if a patient, if a doctor wants to see the medical record of the, uh, of the patient, uh, he needs to ask for permission for, uh, for the medical record. And the patient can authorize or not to give that medical record and for a, a limited time, a, a, a limited time um, uh, a window. Uh, another thing about the new health life that is coming in the next releases in the near future is the digitalization of the hospital assets. Because right now we're discussing about the patient experience on the upstream. I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing the, the terminology from the supply chain, which is very important because of the ownership, data ownership and so on. But also what is more important is how we are making the healthcare system better. So by digitalizing the assets of the hospital, when I say assets, I mean uh, the consumables, uh, the different, let's say, machines, beds that are used for that patient. You're collecting um, a big amount of data that you can understand the deficiencies, the bottlenecks, 
and actually where the hospital is performing well. And in that sense, you are becoming better as a hospital and you are serving the paramount purpose of a hospital, which is the better treatment and experience for a patient. On the part two of the question about the government, uh, I want to thank uh, our strategic partner, Kusho Scorfiotis Pavarhalambus Law Office in Cyprus, uh, that because before we started building the solution, we sat down with the lawyers uh, of, of the law firm and we discussed about how to make it GDPR compliant. And as I said, there is no regulation about public blockchains and GDPR and privacy law. So uh, they advise us to use the best practices to how to make it as compliant as possible. Uh, we also presented to the government what we were doing in the airport. And yeah, I mean, they are aware of what we are doing. Uh, so there are no um, let's say red flags over there. And my last comment on about how the government accepted it is there is no, okay, because they don't comment about it, I'm going to say it like this, yeah. Um, the solver in a country is not the government, is the people. And when we see 2,000 people in less than 10 days downloading the application and feeling happy to see their result on the mobile app, you can understand that it's also the acceptance by the society. It's like with Facebook. I mean, we had the Facebook for 11 years before the GDPR compliance. So most of the governments allow, um, let's say, the technology to proceed, and then they intervene when there is malpractice and the, the, the technology is not serving uh, the subject object, which is the people. Okay, okay. And just because addressing the question before about Oracle, so then your, what you're saying is your data is coming from the laboratory machines directly? Directly, yes. So just and for COVID-19 results at the moment, and then, and then how would you uh, expand that to other results? We have already built the integrator that it talks to all of the lab tests but we haven't uh, made it available for the people. And the reason is because, as I said, if we start bombarding people with technology, uh, they cannot digest it. So there is a transition period. So we started with COVID-19, and then we go into the lab test, all of the lab tests, and then we are going to also introduce the new health life. Even though the new health life is ready, we're delaying the deployment so people can start getting aware with the digital transformation of the healthcare. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, right, because um, I mean, as I mentioned before, we've also, um, we've already launched ours in the American Medical Center and yeah, um, you know, we were following similar, similar protocols, you know, connecting directly with the laboratory information systems, uh, getting that information in directly. I think it's definitely, you know, the only way to make sure the data is trusted. And um, so that's, that's great. Um, and I'm just reading here a few more questions. Um, let me see. Sorry, Georgina, just to, just to add a little note to that. What, so for example, with, with our use case where we're using patient data or data from medical records to determine the cost of care of a therapy, we can't, you know, it, it was difficult for us to try and protect this data, you know, before it was entered, you know, bad data obviously is, is always going to be a problem in blockchain. So what we, we decided to do is utilize a different technology stack, utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning mm -hmm. to actually identify patterns of data within the patient record that don't make sense essentially, because in yeah. our use case, there was an incentive for let's say hospitals to say that this high cost pharmaceutical therapy didn't provide as good outcomes as, as, as you know, mm -hmm. was promised or expected because then they pay less essentially for that. So with mm -hmm. that, we had to create this additional mechanism. And then obviously we have the, 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 the tamper proof proof of blockchain once that data is in, input to the system and any additional security features that we can provide within our system like this have gone down well with all our, uh, our clients. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I and mean, that's exactly what, you know, we've done with our team. I mean, it's great to focus on, obviously, blockchain is really important. We see the benefits of it, uh, for managing the data, for privacy. Um, 
but it's just data still. So it's, it's using those other technologies, analyzing the data. We do a lot of analytics on the data and helping people actually, actually make that data useful, not only to the patients, but to the doctors, to the insurance companies, to the government. And that's something, um, you know, we, we've done a lot of work on the further from, from blockchain, but actually having analytics on the data and actually really caring. The fact is, who cares about technology? What matters is people and people's health and making sure they can be empowered. And we should be always thinking about any technology we use for the purpose of benefiting the end stakeholders, which ultimately is the patient, but obviously there's a lot of people who need to support the patient. Uh, so really making sure we, we address true problems and don't just try and force blockchain in for the sake of it. Um, okay, so um, let's move on to one more question then. Okay, so block.co enables the issuance of digital certificates anchored to the blockchain. And the purpose of that is it gives immutability and security of those certificates. So, for example, I used to, you know, I got my um, degree and I used to work for the University of Nicosia. You get your, your degree from them and you can go and check on an independent verifier that this degree was uploaded to the Bitcoin blockchain and it definitely has not been tampered with, edited. So you're sure that that person you're interviewing has definitely got the credentials which they say they have. So considering that, how could you envision the use of block.co solution as part of a blockchain-based healthcare system? I mean, that could be in relation to medical records, prescription issuance, maybe medical insurance. Where do you see such a, um, you know, a technology being used? I'd say one thing that stands out for me, I think, during this COVID crisis um, is certification for equipment or PPE from all these different countries. I mean, there's been a lot of fraud, uh, you know, fake conformity certificates and, and all of these things, or whether it's around a mask or, or, or whatever it is, aprons, gowns, whatever it is. And I think there was a huge need for something like this around the certification side. I, uh, some organizations did develop some sort of supply chain solutions to be able to see what's in stock and, you know, where they could acquire these things. But there, there, was, there was no solution that really focused on the authenticity and certification of these things and making sure they're on, they're on you know. Um, I mean, we certainly have those. We have authenticity for in other areas in supply chain. And I think you could quickly morph that to. The medical supply chain. I mean, we do it for wine, for example, right? That it, it's authentic all the way from the, the field to the bottle. You can do the same thing. We do that with vaccines, for example, Merck Animal Health. So I don't know that you need, it's not, I don't know that it's the ultimate certificate. I mean, that ultimate certificate's great, but I, I think when you're talking about, to your point, Amin, about supplies, I mean, you want to track it all the way from the manufacturer to the truck to the delivery mm -hmm. because things can get swapped out anywhere along the way. Um, just cause I got a certificate at the beginning doesn't mean it's the same matches the same palette at the end, mm -hmm. a little bit more complicated than just a certificate for medical supplies. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, a degree is one thing, right? Yeah. You're, you're, the, you're the person you finished it. You did the degree. So we want to match your, identification with you got this degree that from this university i mean now we're triangulating on three things but you you control control it's a little bit different in the supply chain yeah i totally agree with you alice i mean in the supply chain is more trivial uh, i mean when you go downstream you need to check all of the stakeholders in the supply chain you need to do auditing we have done this with dnvgl yeah. for the wine uh, for the olive oil, uh, now with the buyer in China, we've done, we are doing this. Yeah. So I totally yeah. agree with you uh, on that one. Uh, but uh, I'm thinking about the block hole. I'm going to say it now in public. Uh, I have a discussion with Alex Nicolau, uh, who is the CEO of block hole, uh, about the use of each and blockchain in their business model. And we are discussing of creating a personal, let's say, wallet of certificates on this personal aspects that are not that trivial. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna hear a lot from us coming soon, I hope. 
Okay, in relation to healthcare or, or in other areas? In other areas, in other areas. Okay, very exciting. Okay. Less trivial than healthcare because uh, the healthcare, as I said, the data source is trivial. So, I mean, if you have the stakeholders that are playing a role in providing the data, it's one thing and you need to identify and audit uh, the mm -hmm. stream of and the flow of data. Uh, so we're gonna start with uh, something more uh, easy and understandable also by the end user. Okay, okay. All right, let me ask another question from the chat. So uh, one person has asked, how can we use blockchain technology by governments in Africa, um, say the Ministry of Health, to have patient autonomy of medical records that can be accessed by any government hospital? Um, irrespective of the ailment and a record printed by the previous hospital and doctor, such as referral cases, without having to open a new file. Any comments there? Uh, okay, uh, let me say what we're doing with the New Health Life and the Mediterranean Hospital and the GHS, which is also known as GSE. Uh, we have created a portal a unique portal for the doctors of the different, let's say, institutions, also that are not included in the GHS, to have access uh, and request permission to, uh, let's say, uh, see the medical record of the person. Mm -hmm. uh, so the portal, the web portal of Inu Health Life is one for patients and another one for the doctors. So in that way, you don't need to duplicate the information. You just log in as a doctor, and you ask for permission of the patient to share his medical record. Okay, so it's the, the patient that then shares them with the doctor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and of course the doctor needs to, let's say, register in the portal of in Health Life in order to have the ca capacity to ask for the permission to have access on the medical record of the patient. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on that? I guess I'm not quite understanding. Are you using blockchain in that? I mean, many portals exist that we give consent without so, blockchain. So, so um, the, the, the solution is built in different layers. So the application is built in a centralized database, of course, yeah, with encryption and all the necessary uh, security that is needed. But what the blockchain role is there, I mean, if a doctor access a medical record without the authorization, there is an algorithm that is triggering the smart contract on the hash that is notifying the user, the patient, that his medical record has been accessed without his authorization and permission. Sure, okay. So it kind of works, the doctor can access it and then the patient's told or the patient needs to give permission for it to be accessed? The, there is a chance of unauthorized access but the patient is immediately informed and he can see what has been done in his medical record. Yeah, and I would say that that exists, that, that exists within electronic health records without blockchain. Yeah, thank you, someone else popped that up. <laughs> popped that up. And again, we're all always pushing it back uh, on, do we need blockchain for that? Does that solution already exist without blockchain? Um, what do we gain by adding blockchain to that solution? As, as someone already noted that, that that exists already. Well, um, it, it it exists, Alice. But sorry for intervening. But there is no transaction. I mean, you need to trust a centralized database. Whereas with blockchain, there is a ledger with transactions that you can see. Okay, the, there uh, goes. We're, we're agreeing that the, there's a ledger already, though, in an electronic health records. I can go and yeah, I can see. Done. I can see. I can make a request right now. For example, the health information exchange in my area. Uh, so I live in an area with a population of about 1.3 million, so we can compare that to certain states. But I can, and I have tested it, uh, I want to see a request of everyone who's looked at my data. They can provide a log instantly to me. And, and I, I know in other countries, they can go onto their portal and see that log. And these are not blockchain enabled. So I don't and, think we're, dis yeah. we're not disagreeing that those ledgers are helpful and useful. I agree with you. I, I'm just saying, I just question, and that's what we, we need to do. Why blockchain for that? The full transparency, because on the centralized database, you rely on the IT support of a company. 
So there is no one, let's say, auditing or be accountable on that one. I mean, the information so the blockchain, you'll take, because Mediterranean Hospital is part of the general health care system, which already has a platform which patients can access their data, doctors access their data. So is this a separate platform with the same data on it or? It's a, it's a complementary uh, running parallel uh, platform, yes. We are okay. not here to, to, to compete with the platform, with the GHS platform or the information system of the hospital. We just put another element of transparency and, and full control of the medical records, which runs in parallel as a complementary. So the, pa but the patient has to have access to data points? He can decide which uh, data points he can he use. Have a choice. So he's got the same data mm -hmm. on two systems, basically. Exactly. One is under the government. Uh, and so anyway, all, all National Health Service doctors can view it. The other one's on your platform, which I guess the benefit is a uh, non-National Health doctor could view it. Uh, actually, any National Health can view it. I mean, we, it's open source. So they can download the application and they can view it. And I mean, do you have all medical records on there now or not yet? Because I'm surprised the government are okay with that. Are they okay taking this data off their system and into a, a different system? So what we have right now and what's going to have be happening right now, as I said, the first one is the HR, which has the medical lab test. And the second one is the visit in the emergency room. So we start with the emergency room visits. So it's not everything going to be there, but just two important aspects, the medical lab test and the patient visits in the emergency room. Okay. All right. Um, Ahmed, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I, th I think a lot of those, uh, the, the key points were, were, were covered within that. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of potential benefits from that. I mean, we, we haven't even really touched upon much at mm -hmm. all in our call about, you know, the synchronized view of, of this ledger and how it can be useful for a lot of these stakeholders when they're working together, especially if, if, if healthcare, especially value-based healthcare requires this collaborative environment as well. Um, and that's something where, where blockchain can come in, come into its own as well. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we've got a few questions, but I'm going to have to uh, move on to our last section and we'll try and come back to as many questions as we can at the end. So just, uh, I'm going to put another poll for uh, the audience. One moment. Okay, guys, so there's another poll uh, I've just launched. So we've got two questions here. How important is having control over healthcare data to you? So is it extremely important, very important, somewhat important, not important at all? And how useful do you feel blockchain is as a technology for creating a healthcare data ecosystem? Again, extremely useful, very useful, somewhat useful, not so useful. Let's have a look at that. Okay, I'll just give you a few more seconds to vote. People are still voting. If there are a couple of questions there. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna end that poll now if anyone else wants to vote. Okay, so we've got 65% of people are saying that it is extremely important for them to have access to their healthcare data. I think that's, that's really great to hear. And then I'm 32% saying very important. So only 4% not so convinced i think especially people that maybe have medical conditions or looking after family members they understand that you know healthcare data really is important and definitely something not as available as it should be um and the second question how useful do you feel, feel blockchain is as a technology well we've got 46 percent again so the majority um are saying extremely useful and 37 percent saying very useful so people are definitely seeing why blockchain is important. Healthcare ecosystem in many different areas there. And only 4% saying not so useful and 14% somewhat useful. So that's really interesting to see. And obviously people are really starting to get 
why healthcare, why blockchain? So that's great. Okay, so I'm going to move on to um, one more question. So the future of digital identities. So digital identity, I think, really is an essential area that underlines all blockchain applications, really. I mean, we need to be able to link the data to the right people, and that needs to be done through, through digital identity. So I want to ask really all of you how you envision the future of digital ID cards and their impact, impact on the medical uh, record. Um, in particular, we've seen Estonia, they've been really pioneers uh, in blockchain and using blockchain in healthcare for I think more than three years now. And so remember, we'll see that's, remember that's a country of 1.3 million people. So I love, they love it's it again. A great start. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a great start. Can you scale, can you take that one point, take that model and now scale it to 10 million, 50 million, 100. So, okay, so, well, then you start out. I mean, do you think we have anything we can learn from Estonia? Or, I mean, how do you see, like, uh, digital IDs being, yeah, maybe implemented um, yeah. in the it's U.S.? Not that, it's not that we don't have anything to learn from them. I, I, I want to be really clear. I just want people to put it in perspective about scalability. Mm -hmm. This is the, the issue we get into. Like like I said, that it's, it's 1.3 million people, single culture, single Right. One of the reasons that digital ID hasn't flown in the United States, we're not allowed to have a national identifier used in the healthcare system by law, by regulation. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Systems cannot even request that that happen. So we have no national identifier for healthcare. We cannot use social security numbers. We cannot have a single. So mm -hmm. that is just what's been, that's just the culture here and the concerns about privacy and data. So we're, we would still be up against that, even with a digital ID in the U.S. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, different. It's definitely really important mm -hmm. to consider. Obviously, it's one thing uh, talking about individual countries, small countries, large countries. I think the U.S. is one of the, shall we say, more complicated countries because you have so many different states, different ways of working. It, it's very difficult to have that sort of uniformity. Um, Ahmed, what do you think? Um, I'd say, you know, any, any sort of decentralized, you know, uh, digital identity management needs to be based on standards and these standards aren't really available yet. Um, and to be honest, in, in addition to having these new standards that are related to this uh, uh, DIM, it also needs to be compatible with what, what's been done previously as well. Um, so I think there's still quite a lot of work to be done in that area, um, but I think it's, it's definitely something that can be used in the future, you know, uh, w where it makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. uh, I totally agree with Alice. I mean, different jurisdictions have their own legislation and we need to be cautious when we start uh, talking about scalability, especially coming from a small country like Estonia and going to US. Uh, I want to comment about like with the new health life that is the first, let's say, use case in the in the emergency room with the Mitrena Hospital, the patient is given an NFC uh, card with no identifiers on it, so he can scan it on the totem and also by the different PCs in the emergency room by the hospital, so he can be identifiable. Uh, the NFC card it has a unique ID uh, on the blockchain that is in, uh, the importance there is like you cannot clone it. Uh, because using the most secure NFC chip available in the market. Uh, and also, as I said, everything comes back to the question, if we're going to issue cards uh, with the unique IDs, and um, I, when I say unique IDs, I mean unique ID of the card, not of the person, and then link it to the person, how GDPR compliant we can be. And the answer is back to the privacy by design and the best practices that are available right now, because we're... Um, there is a gray area in the regulation, especially in the EU level, uh, about creating decentralized digital IDs. What do you mean that's a gray area? Can you expand on that? Okay, because there is no regulation uh, and they're just recommendation papers, uh, we need to be cautious. We need to use the best practices available uh, we need to take in consideration the privacy by design. Uh, we need to make it as hard as possible the 
the patient not to be either directly or indirectly identifiable. So on the, on the blockchain, I mean, a level. So it needs to be cautious when we're building such a solution. And we have been cautious as uh, Avicen and Idante, but still, I mean, there is a room, uh, the technology is always getting better every day. So we have our eyes open and we're putting the security, the integrity of the data and the price of the data on the highest level. Mm -hmm. And I mean, given if we're talking about a healthcare ecosystem, I mean, a healthcare ecosystem needs to be, it's ambitious, but combining public data, private data, all different medical records. Do we think that this should be linked to government IDs? I mean, I think now we're talking more about, like, I think you're talking about, uh, you know, private IDs being created. For example, the Mediterranean will have an ID mm -hmm. for that person, but how do we then link that step further if we're going to be bringing in multiple sources of data? Well, we're going to open source it to the government of Cyprus, if they ask us. If they ask uh, I mean, if they said to you, is they, they want to use the solution, we open source that, we don't mind. I mean, even the, 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 the second solution I talked about, the EH cert, which is the lab test electronic wallet for COVID-19, we offer it for free. I mean, any, any country can use it for free. We, we give it for free because we are serving a bigger cause. We have a noble obligation towards this pandemic and towards also the patients. Okay. Ahmed, what about in the UK? I mean, um, how do you see digital ID and from your experience at the UN, like how important is that sort of digital identification um, as part of this? I mean, um, so let's say, let's take the National Health Service in the UK, for example. They utilize, um, you know, standard, you know, the identification techniques during data sharing. They use tokenization mechanisms, but very different to what tokenization is from the, the block pay, blockchain point of view. Um, so they use con 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 conventional methods. To be honest, I do not, I have not heard of any uh, intentions to roll out, you know, digital identity management, you know, nationally or regionally or anything like that relating to, you know, patient records or anything like this. You know, um, I don't think they're, 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 they're trying to do that at the moment. No, I think, I mean, the UK is, uh, you know, one of the, I think, probably the only country in Europe that doesn't even have identity cards for individual <laughs> citizens. Um, so I think, yeah, I guess leaping forward to digital identity, maybe maybe it's too soon for them now. Um, yeah, okay. Um, all right, I'm just seeing if there's any more questions. Is there, okay, well, we're getting to the end of this se session. So I just want to see, does anyone of the panelists want to add any further questions, any further comments to, to this topic? No? Okay then, well, I just want to say thank you to everyone then, and thank you to the audience. We've had a great audience uh, with lots of questions coming through, lots of comments. You're clearly all, um, you know, very interested, knowledgeable about the area, and it's really great to have those challenging questions. I know we haven't managed to get to all those questions, but Block.co um, will be taking all these questions and coming back to you, probably speaking with uh, the experts here, uh, if needed and coming back to you with questions. And also if anybody, a part of organizations which can see a use for Block.co's um, technology, then they, you know, please reach out to them and, and let them know. So before we leave, I'm just going to put one more poll up uh, to just get some, some feedback on, on the session and, and your um, comments on a few different healthcare areas. So we just want to see if anyone's who's been faced with issues with uh, in medical fraud, um, whether you think block.co's solution of securing document authenticity via the blockchain can be of value to your organization. Uh, is your company looking at applying new technology for combating fraud and mitigating risk? And then finally, what kind of topics would you like block.co to cover in future webinars? This is a really important question because Block.co really listen to its audience and make sure that they, they get the best experts in which cover the sectors which people are most looking to hear.
Okay, let me just have those four questions there. I'll give you just a little bit longer to, to answer those questions. Um, okay. Give it a few more seconds of answer a few questions. And I guess you cannot vote, right? Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Do you want to give me um, a... <laughs> I didn't manage to uh, yeah, allow that option. But um, I'm sure... Have any of you experienced medical fraud? Interesting stories. I had a bad experience, uh, not about medical fraud, but about, about uh, medical systems. So that's why I was so passionate to design one. Uh, I have the Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. And when I had my second flare up, I was in the UK mm -hmm. and it was so hard to, to find out which medication I was taking. I need to contact back my parents in Cyprus. Uh, so I know by experience how important is uh, the medical records to be mm -hmm. a natural extension in a digital form, even in a phone or in a card for the patients that they're going to, let's say, have similar and uh, situation or an emergency situation like I had. Yeah, yeah, of course. I agree with you. I, I think I hear stories every day about people that have real experience of struggling to manage, whether it's a chronic illness or a parent's health or their children's health. You know, it's, it's a real day-to-day -day issue. So we've got the results in. 80% of people actually say they haven't had any medical records fraud, but that's still 20% have, so that's, that's interesting. And yes, 55% of people would do see that Block.co solution can be of value for securing document authenticity. And um, we've got 45% also saying yes, that their companies are looking at um, applying new technologies for combating fraud. Only 25% saying no and 30% you know, thinking about that. Um, and then finally, the most popular topics to cover in future, we've got 25% saying blockchain in the public sector and 25% looking at supply chain, which I think is key. And interesting to see that digital identity, 16% and general transformation support by blockchain. So that's great to see. Okay then, so finally, I just want to say thank you for everyone attending. Thank you for your time. I think we covered a lot of different topics and really challenged ourselves as to how blockchain can be used, why blockchain can be used in many different sectors. And I'm sure we just need more time to see how this area develops. So stay safe, everybody, and see you at the next webinar. And let me just remind everybody that you will all be getting certificates of attendance and that those are from blockchain, um, from block.co will be registered on the Bitcoin blockchain. So they will be self-verifiable. All right. So thank you, everybody. And see you at the next webcast. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Blocko. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you, Alice. Bye. -bye. Bye.